Welcome to Conversations. I'm Bill Crystal. Pleased to be joined today by my friend Stan Voiger, a resident scholar in economics at American Enterprise Institute, a student of public finance, teach at Harvard some, teach in various European universities some. But we're going to talk more about Europe and less about economics. Is that okay? Oh, that's fine. You're from yeah. Europe. Yeah, so that's right. You yeah. grew up in the Netherlands. You went to college there, I think. Correct. You stay in close touch. You teach I do in a couple of places yep. In, yep. in Europe. Yep. So let's talk about Europe, which is an interesting topic, I think. Kind that's of right. an important part of the world in terms of world history, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. old enough to mm -hmm. remember when it was central to world history. Mm -hmm. And maybe mm -hmm. you'll explain that it's going to be central again or could be or should that be. That may be or... a bit of a, of a stretch, but I think it's certainly important. Okay, so and, what's, and yeah, and, so let's. Yeah. So, I mean, what's the situation? You know, conservatives, I mean, we mostly hang out with conservatives, though mm -hmm. we, I guess, argue with them for a certain amount, are very down on Europe, I think it's safe to say. You know, it's sort of an example of um, economic uh, sclerosis and political, I don't know, lack of will, and some of them are in favor of Brexit or breaking up the EU. And I mean, give me your overall take, you know, here, so in, my 20, overall here take in is December of 2019. That's on, right. On my overall take is, and thank you for having me on this uh, outstanding yeah. uh, show. Um, my overall take is significantly more positive than, than that. Um, certainly, I think, on the economic side. So there are, I think there are real problems Europe has. I don't think it's figured out how to position itself on the national security front. I think there it's still, you know, much more reliant upon the, upon the U.S. in a way that may not be ideal for either side of the of the Atlantic uh, alliance um, it doesn't have the kind of population growth that you know might be might be helpful but economically I think it's been doing okay um, and I think the European project as embodied in as embodied in the EU as opposed to the the continent as a whole has really delivered on on many of its original uh, 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 aspirations and so the I think the, the first and most salient thing that people say, and I think it deserves to be said, is that there have been no, no armed conflicts yeah. uh, between the various members of the European Union to the point that people take that for granted now and you know, almost insulted when you, uh, right. when you say that that's a real accomplishment, right? It's a bit like how the, uh, the socialists don't like it when you bring up Venezuela, you know? It's like, oh right. no, that's not, right. um, you're not allowed to use that argument for some bizarre reason. Um, and so I think that is a real accomplishment. Obviously, the U.S. has had uh, a, a, has played a real and, and, and important role there, and that, that and does so till this day. And it's not that there have been no armed conflicts on the continent, right? We've we've we had uh, horrible crimes against humanity in the Balkans in, as, as recently as the '90s. We have an ongoing armed conflict in Ukraine, and so I don't think we can just say, okay, well, you know, everything was going to be fine. In fact, the probably the most um, uh, the most contested land in Western Europe, in, in Northern Ireland, I think there the, the, the peace that has reigned for about 20 years now was very much a product of European integration in a way that, uh, that has become very, very clear uh, as we've gone through the, uh, through the Brexit process. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it is striking that, uh, and I myself have been part of the kind of somewhat naysayers about Europe, or I don't know, whatever, just don't, it's not... Yeah. I mean, nothing is always, not, nothing's ever perfect. Right? It's, it's not in like, accord yeah. somehow yeah. With, with my view, and I think with a lot of Americans' view of what great countries should do or should be like or how people should live or what their aspirations should be, and it seems a little bit, you know, uh, sort of uh, complacent and, you know, of course doing fine economically, but no real vision, no real great project, no, no whatever. But having said that, yeah, if you step back and said in 1950, okay, there's this European project, and here's where we're going to be in 20. Yeah, Portugal uh, was a dictatorship, Spain was a dictatorship. You know, uh, right, was, yeah. in the aftermath of two unbelievable yeah. wars, uh, none of that really. And even if you want to say distinguish the EU as you did from the fringe areas where there's been war fighting, but in a way the solution to the, at least in the Balkans, was main solution was military at first, but then in fact it was absorbing them into both the EU and NATO. That's right. right yeah. I mean, we can shorthand, I guess, NATO is, and yeah. the EU is Well, and that's why you see the interplay of the, the military alliance with the U.S. and the, and the, the more political economic pro process within the, uh, within the continent, I think, you know, working out pretty nicely, sort of as, as, one would, as one would like to see. Um, and for all the decadents, allegedly, of Europe, they did hang tough enough to, to let the Soviet Union crumble and uh, yeah, that's the right. Berlin Wall the, fall, right? I mean... Yeah, exactly, and the and dealt pretty well with the fallout there, right? So massive subsidies from West Germany to East Germany right. uh, to to bring it back into the the fold sort of of the European economy, and so on the on the economic side, which I think is what drives quite a bit of the skepticism about the European Union. Obviously, Europe is significantly poorer than the U.S., right? So the 
the GDP of the uh, gross domestic product of the European Union and that of the U.S. is about similar, but the European Union has way more people, whereas a little bit over half a billion, whereas the U.S. is around, what, 340? 340, 340, 340, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so that's a big gap. Uh, but that gap has been there for a while, and a lot of it is simply that uh, Europeans work less, right? Which, you know, it's a trade-off you you can make, right? It's not, I mean, right, so maybe not the economic model you and I would like. And tax rates are much higher, um, and so as a con retirement ages are, are earlier, and so as a consequence, just the you know, total number of hours worked is much lower, and that explains quite a good chunk of that of that gap. But all in, and I, I just this honestly just don't know. I mean, how much? Compare over 70 years and over then the most recent 50 or 30. Or t how different is the rate of growth in Europe and in general? In the well, US? so there, that, that's uh, there. The comparison the really US depends on how you look at it. Started out with a huge advantage after World War II. That, that's right. That's right. So uh, some of it is that. But then what you would expect is you would expect uh, poor, poorer countries to catch up, right? To, to converge to where the the productivity frontier is, and so. Um, if you look at more recent decades, the last 20 years or so, the EU has grown a little more slowly than the U.S., but that is mostly because of slower population growth. If you look at real, uh, at, if you look at per capita growth, it's been very similar. Um, you know, maybe a little lower because of the fallout of the crisis. That was a little more severe in in Europe than in the U.S., but but overall pretty similar. Now. If you're a dedicated naysayer, you may say, well, you know, the Eastern European countries grow faster because they started from, you know, uh, having just come through through communism. But but even for some of the more developed countries, uh, the, the numbers are still are pretty good. And so what you really have is more of a level difference, right, where people work a little less and uh, the capital markets don't work as well. And so you, you have a, a poorer continent. There are some areas where I think uh, Europe has had actually quite good economic policy and uh, I think that the, the the European Union has has played a, a big role in that. Obviously, uh, the you know part of the original project was to to avoid war in Europe. I think the second one was to uh, to generate economic prosperity. Uh, and so there, the really the the fundamental goal was to and this is a very sort of whatever, conservative neoliberal project was to create a a a, a common economy. Right, right. at first. Uh, focused on specific key industries, but sort of starting from the 80s and, and 90s, really focused on creating a full-fledged common market, uh, the way the U.S. In, in in many ways is. Right, and so there you get the 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 real implementation of the freedom of movement of of goods, of services, uh, of capital, and of people. And so there, I think the the when it came to implementing that, I think the the European institutions have played really important roles. Right. Uh, first of all, obviously, all tariffs were all done away with uh, within the European Union, um, and then the focus shifted uh, more toward what we what we call non-tariff barriers to trade, and it's gone pretty far there. So there's a case from the early '80s, the Commission against Ireland, where Ireland wanted to uh, start a buy Irish campaign, and so that was deemed to violate the free movement of uh, of goods. Um, in you know how Europeans like to label label their food in certain ways, uh, there have been many cases on that where often uh, the European institutions have th have said no, you're not allowed to say uh, that beer can only have these specific ingredients. Germany, you have to accept beer from other countries if it can be sold in those other countries. Those kinds of uh, measures, and you know each each specific one sounds a little silly, but that's how you build. A, a market a, a market for with and free it is movement genuinely but, one market yeah. now right that's right that's right I certainly mean, on the much. good side on the services side obviously it's more difficult um, and but even on the the free movement of labor side right which is a dramatic accomplishment that really the, you know since sort of the 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 day of modern immigration restrictions we really haven't seen that that anything like this right where anyone within the European Union can basically move elsewhere uh, to work, right? If you, you really have to go out of your way to move exclusively to benefit from a welfare system to, to, to be removed from a, from a member state. Um, and so that, the freedoms that has created, I think, for people uh, have been tremendously valuable. And that's held up pretty well under the strains of the last Yes, decade, entirely. Right. And the so the only cut back and yeah. So the only the the aspect that uh, I think has been a little more controversial is the uh, the complete lack of passport controls uh, under the under the Schengen Agreement. Now, not that, that not every member of the European Union was was in that was part of that scheme to begin with, um, and that's still something that is separate from uh, residency requirements, right? So you would still even 
if there, uh, if password controls were, were reinstated, you would still be able to show your password and move to a different member state. That's never been in, in dispute. Right. Uh, and so that is really completely embedded in all the various structures of the European Union. And the euro, which was a big object of controversy among so that's our a good friends example of, your teacher, yeah. Marty Feldstein, yeah, I remember a, talking to him about it yeah. 15, 20 years ago, very skeptical, I think, yeah. about it. And, and so I think that's a good example of something that uh, has not worked out. Uh, 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 as brilliantly as, as uh, people hoped. Obviously, again, there's a big symbolic dimension to that, to that kind of project. Uh, um, and some argue that it was the, uh, the, the, the sort of part of the negotiations around the unification of Germany um, was, to, um, was, to, was to make sure that, that you know, that one of Germans' strengths was, was Europeanized, as I say. Right. Um, but, but yeah, there's definitely weaknesses there. I think the big cost we've seen there is that, there, is that after the financial crisis, uh, recovery, which, which slowed down quite a bit in a number of countries, uh, that outside of the euro would have devalued and, and recovered a little faster uh, that way. Um, and so I think that it's an imperfect project. I think people at the European Commission are very aware of that. Uh, the, I mean, the, the, the unfortunate situation is that we're at a point where that's, that no one sees as optimal, right? So there's people who never really wanted a, a common currency. And then there's people who say to fully benefit from a common currency, you need to build around the common currency things like a shared fiscal policy or uh, a banking union, or a, couple of mar a capital markets union. And so, I mean, I assume that we'll drift in that direction. And then the question really becomes, do you have shared fiscal policy and shared unemployment insurance, which may be a little uh, harder to, to, to accept for, for people who worry about the, the traditional economic policies of all but four European countries? Um, or do we go more in a direction where we maintain uh, economic or at least tax policy as a, as a national uh, instrument and try to complement that with banking supervision at the European level, which has been implemented more or less, and especially more integration on the capital market side, right? So one reason why uh, shocks in the U.S. Uh, are, are shared much better between the, across the states and the regions than in, the, than in Europe is because a lot of, Euro a lot of American companies uh, run businesses in other states, right, in a way that, that right. we don't even think about, right? Walking around, like obviously CVS has, has stores all over the country. Right. Uh, there's banks, you know, the, the, I don't know how many brand names you want me to drop uh, on your podcast, but you know, Bank of yeah. America, is that really, you did, right. what state is that from is a hard question right. to answer for, right. for most consumers. And so that hasn't really happened yet in Europe. And so that kind of integration uh, should help a lot with risk sharing, right? Because as a what, what it would have as a consequence is that there are people in every state who work at these companies that are a little more resilient to, to location-specific uh, shocks, and that the people who own uh, you know, stocks or, or, or bonds uh, in, in, in the corporate sector are also a little more isolated from, from, from shocks to their specific country, right? If you're, uh, in a, if you're an, uh, an upper middle class Italian person, right? maybe you have a you know, family business that you partially own, and then you have a bunch of uh, Italian stocks often. Right? That's not how people in the US right. uh, isolate themselves from economic shocks. And, not, and they're not even thinking about it that way. Right? They're not saying, oh no, we need to make sure that we in Montana share our risks with Delaware and Florida. No, they just, you know, they buy the S&P 500 or whatever, and they're, right. they're insulated. And so I think that's, so from my perspective, that's the ideal way for, for the EU to come up with, uh, uh, to, to develop a currency union that is closer to sort of an optimal currency union. I don't I think you can, you know, you can, you, I don't think writing checks from Brussels whenever, there is, whenever a, a, a company goes under somewhere in Latvia should be the, the model. Yeah. And Euroskeptics and, you know, a lot of friends of mine, yours I suppose, 08, 9, 10, when the euro was under so much pressure and was being blamed, I suppose, somewhat correctly for slowing the recovery yeah. in Greece and some of those countries and causing a populist yeah. uprising. We were all like, well, look at the U.S. We don't have anything like that. I mean, that, that's a, you can't impose this kind of thing on a diverse continent. And, but, of course, we've had as much of a populist response yeah. in our United system. Yeah. You know the difference between you know closed steel mills in Canton, Ohio, and Silicon Valley seems as great as the difference. I don't know if it's quite as great, but it, it's politically it's had similar effects to yeah. the, uh, you know. No, for sure, and that. Uh, I so mean, maybe it's not such a you know we we can't look down as much on Europe's 
travails in that respect. That's right. So I think the the way to think of it is that it's difference of 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 degree, not of kind. Right? That they're you know the obviously the European Union is not as integrated a common market as the U.S. is, but um, but it's but it's not completely different. And remember, there's there's a lot of state regulation in the U.S. in a way that right. it would for sure be illegal in the European Union because it imposes you know direct or indirect barriers on on activities from other from other states. Um, you know, the, California setting its own rules in the car industry would be that's uh, not that uh, yeah. would be hard to hard to think how Spain would be able to get away with that. Yeah, yeah. And, and the truth is, ultimately, those countries mostly have come back. So, I mean, you know, whatever the problem they had with yeah. the euro and not being able to devalue. Well, one, it's one, not very, as if, I one mean, very cynical way of looking at it is if you as the advantage of uh, a, a, a European Union like setup is that political con- political problems are much more concentrated in a specific place. Right. If you if you have a, 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 a you know a populist party or a quasi authoritarian party in Spain or in Hungary, due to to a first approximation, that's a problem for Spain or Hungary. Not it doesn't right. immediately overwhelm the uh, governance and public discourse in every other country. And so you know the, again, it's, it's the classical trade off between you know nationalizing yeah. and federalizing. And we have some of that yeah. federalism. Yeah. We have. You know, some very bad race relations in some places, but no, it doesn't right. become yeah. a you yeah. know a na- natural yeah. Uh, t- yeah. Yeah. T- tragedy necessarily. Yeah. Or, or um, well, you see the trade-off very well there, actually, right? So now, the the country that's probably in the worst shape in Europe is Hungary, right? Authoritarian leader, uh, basically all the news media, uh, except for a few, were bought up by a group that's very clearly uh, allied with the uh, party and person in power. Massive corruption problems. Um, and the, the, right, the most dedicated Eurosceptics will say, oh, well, look, the European Union can't do anything right. Of course, the only way for the European Union to, to deal with that uh, kind of problem in a forceful way would, to, would be to give it more power and to let it make decisions, not by consensus, but through qualified majorities. Um, I don't think that those same people are ready for those kinds of right, right. Uh, solutions. Um, but, you know, it's a process. I, it, it, and to go back to the U.S., obviously, this is what, in, in a sense, happened in the U.S., right? It didn't have democratic institutions in the South uh, until, really, at the national level, it was decided, okay, we're no longer going to accept this blocking minority, and we're going to move a little closer to a pure majoritarian Right, more uh, centralized system. system. Yeah, but, you know, that comes with, with you know, obviously ended uh, a bad system, but also reduced the autonomy of each individual state, right? And so that's, I think that's how you should think of the the commission's conflict with 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 Hungary. I want to come back to the politics, yeah. which I think is sure. very interesting and important. Just on the economic front, I guess the other standard, I would say, conservative free market complaint about Europe is, you know, it's fine. They live a good life. A lot of extremely capable, good, pretty good education system, maybe better than ours in some ways. Very capable executives, engineers, and so forth, uh, but not the kind of growth, innovation. Uh, yeah, so I think dynamism that's, that's of entirely, the U.S. That's entirely true, right? So, right, I'm sitting here praising the 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 freedom of goods and freedom of movement. Of course, if everything were better than in the in the U.S., you'd expect there to be uh, faster growth. And instead, there's slower, there's maybe marginally slower growth in a place where you would expect much faster growth just because it's poor, right? So you think you'd be able to catch up. And so, obviously, the U.S. has a ton of strength that the that the EU does not have: deeper capital markets, uh, more venture capital. Um, much lower tax rates, right? And so that that really gives people an incentive to work harder because you get to keep more of the more of the money you earn. That's you know that some of those basic incentives are just way better in the U.S. And some cultural differences, uh, obviously. Some cultural, yeah, for sure. The immigration um, and you know the American Im- dream and all that kind of yeah. stuff. Self-made, yeah, no, that's self-made, right. Uh, yeah, the, mm-hmm. exactly. Right? I mean, where do the best uh, the, at the very top? Clearly, the best universities in the world. Right? There's no no. I don't think anyone would argue. Uh, Against that, and so the U.S. has a number of institutions that are way, way better than uh, than what the European Union has. No, to be clear, I'm, the argument, the, the the defense I think I'm making of, of right. economic policy in the in Europe is 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 a very qualified one. It's but I think the strong, I mean, but you sort of implied this before. One strong defense of the European project, though, is this is used against Europe that we have, you know, we create Apple and Google and so forth, yeah. and we have the VC, Which is fair. we have venture yeah. capital. It's not clear that Europe, if Europe had been old Europe, mm-hmm. let's say it had been peace, and so maybe the peace would have happened anyway, but you have old Germany and old France and yeah. old Britain and so forth. It's not obvious. No, that's right. Right, so you have to think You'd of, still have... What's the would alternative? There, would there be... Would they be... Any more entrepreneurship? Or no, isn't that's that, exactly isn't that right. the, so, the culture? Was the culture because maybe what you would have way. is Germany and France would both build their state champions. You know, that'd be right. 
forty percent of the French economy would be owned by Electricité de France because that's the right. the, the big company, and it would all be held together by state aid. And you right? wouldn't I have a culture of, a, of individuals yeah. giving up good jobs to say, yeah. "I'm just going to take a flyer on this startup." Right? Yeah. I mean, right. it's, it's not clear you'd have more of that in a nation-based no, that's, that's exactly right. Europe right. than a Europe-based Europe. Exactly, because a lot of the right, a lot of the the the, the the, the pressures on innovation, I think, have actually been have been reduced by the by the European integration process. Right. The 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 thing that libertarians here maybe hate the most is targeted subsidies, uh, be they you know direct subsidies for developing new products or direct tax subsidies to move somewhere to move to for, to compel a company to move to a different location. Those are both illegal in the EU. Now, obviously, mm. you can argue over what's really a subsidy, what's not. But you know, Apple has had to pay back eleven billion dollars to the European. Uh, to the Irish government because they were given illic illicit state support. That's completely legal in the U.S., right? So you do, and, th and right. that would, that obviously if they were all separate countries, they would constantly be trying to poach each other's uh, companies right. such as they would It's be. not like, yeah, when you read the U.S. media and it's, you know, competing for Amazon. Amazon Who's going to subsidize yeah, Amazon yeah, the most? Yeah. It's not, it's not clear to me why those of us who believe in markets should prefer the U.S. in that part of the U.S. No, exactly. system right, so that's what I'm saying. to so a European a few, system where you say yeah. it's, they can't really do exactly. that. Exactly. Right? So there's a few of these aspects, and, and a, a number of them are very specifically tied to the European Union institutions where, the US, where, where Europe just you know, has more of a free market dimension to its, to its system where it, you know, it, it sits more nicely with the way that we free market, free market economists like to see the world operate. Uh, yeah. You know. um, yeah. And you think this is not to criticize our local business, Amazon, of course. Of course not. Yeah. Yes, good point. Right. Yeah. Now, on the economic front, leaving aside politics again, just for one more minute, you see no particular reason why this can't reasonable growth can't continue. I mean, limited by maybe population growth and so forth. But I mean, there's no nothing's falling off a cliff there or whatever. No, I don't think so. Um, obviously, there's. I mean, there's always a risk of things going in the wrong direction. Uh, I think. Um, there was a, uh, a proposed merger between German and, Fren and French rail companies uh, uh, earlier this year that the Commission blocked, and there was I think there was real economic, real political pressure on the Commission to say no, let's let that go ahead. That would have moved us, I think, away from some one of the strengths of the Commission right. system, which very heavily focused on on maintaining uh, competition, especially in sectors like rail, where there's sort of a threat of natural. Monopoly. Um, I, I worry a little bit about the concern about the currency union not being integrated enough, leading us to a path where there is a European uh, welfare state that is that that will be hard to control and that will be, I think, particularly negative for the poor member states, right? Because the you'll end up for sure with payments that are that are higher in in you know, in cost of living terms in in Hungary or in or in southern Italy or in southern Spain than they would be in Denmark or Sweden. Um, and so that I worry a little bit about, but those kinds of proposals are so unpopular in, in Austria, Finland, Germany, the Netherlands that I, they, that I doubt they'll come to fruition. Um, and you, you know, so that, I mean, because that's, I think that's a, a reason why some states in the U.S. are relatively dysfunctional, right? So you, why in West Virginia, labor force participation is barely above 50 percent, right? It's because in, it, much of the welfare state is done at the federal level, and so all those payments are are higher. If you're lower income, your tax rates are higher because they are, you know, right. they are the same. Um, and I suppose there's not much evidence, I don't know, is there, that size of government, size of welfare state, the kinds of things conservatives tend not to like about Europe, would be very different if Europe again were a Europe of nations as opposed to a again, more integrated so, yeah, yeah. Europe. I'm I mean, glad you I'm glad you keep reminding us of, the, as of that because that's really true, right? The the counterfactual is what matters, right? It's not like all those independent European countries would look like the U, like many U.S.s, right? right? They would. It, I would worry that they would look more like like many Italy's than than like many uh, Netherlands's or whatever your favorite European country right. may be. For me, the wake up call on the, on the economic side, and I'm not sure exactly where I. I haven't really have a considered view on this, but I had a kind of standard Eurosceptic view, I would say, probably from being a bit of an Anglophile and whatever, and, and um, I just had it. I don't know, and then the UK had and to and be bailed out like, by the IMF in 1975, and yeah, you changed your mind. No, so for me, it was going to Spain, okay. and I went to a 
couple of conferences there, mm -hmm. uh, and Portugal actually, uh, which are different, very different countries nonetheless. And with conserv more or less conservative, certainly geopolitically conservative in favor of strong sort of foreign policy and confronting authoritarians and in favor culturally even somewhat conservative in terms of mm -hmm. our traditions. And I remember saying cavalierly once something about, yeah, because the EU, I'm sure that's, you know, that's a problem. And both in Spain and Portugal was, no, no, we, we, are, for, we, are, we are not <laughs> like the Euro sky. We are anything. not like the British. Yeah. I and mean, this was, I think, the big mistake in America where everyone is so focused, maybe just because of language yeah. mostly, on, on Britain that everyone assumes to be conservative is to be Eurosceptic. But if, if you're in Spain, if you w like markets and you like the kind of, you know, the ability to you know, free, free movement of goods, labor, et cetera, breaking up some of the traditional monopolies, some of the traditional uh, unions even, right? Mm -hmm. You're pro-Europe. That's my sense. I think that's fair. I mean, the, in, in, to the extent that people are... If you're liberal in the, in the European sense, you know. Yeah, that's right. So I think to the extent that people are skeptical about the European Union, it's because they're in Northern Europe and they think right. that they're paying for transfers, which is fair, or right. they are, you know, more, they're very, they're very opposed to free movement of people, basically, is, the, is I think right. the, other, the other concern. But, I, but it's important to remember that obviously the dominant political force in building the European Union was the European Christian Democrats that are, you know, obviously it's span a good chunk of the political spectrum, but certainly center right at its core. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you, so you see that in, certainly on the economic side of things, but I think generally in the, in the project, I think you still see some features of it. In fact, that is why a lot of the, the traditional Euroscepticism comes from the hard left. Right? It's, yes, what forgets, labor yeah. opposed yeah. to... Yeah, people who want to nationalize and they're worried that, you know, there's too much competition yeah. across the continent and they won't be able to protect their, their union benefits. So what about, so let's talk about, you mentioned the free movement of people. I mean, what about that? How, how far along would you say, I think it's something Americans have a tough time, you know, we go for a vacation for a week, you know, always, I mean, how European are Europeans and how much is it Spanish and Germans and Dutch and so forth who happen to vacation a little more or even work a little more in each other's countries. Where do you think that part of the European project, how far has it gone? Well, I think it's it's certainly fair to say that Americans are more American than Europeans are European, typically, you know, maybe outside of a few neighborhoods in Brussels. Um, but the, there has been some change. I think now the the typical estimate is that cross-country mobility in the, in, the, in the EU is about a third of what uh, cross-state uh, mobility is in the US. So that's, that's real, you know? Like yeah, the, yeah. Um, and it's concentrated among younger people, so you know, which suggests that it's growing. Uh, but it is more concentrated among the, the highly educated. It's the, you know, the, 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 it, it is a bit of it has a bit of a you know globalist citizens from nowhere uh, uh, bias to it, if you will. But th those numbers are looking better. So that's one area where the EU has has also very intentionally made policy. Right. So it's much easier now to study in a different European country uh, than, it, than it used to be. Uh, that's, really, that's really escalated. So I, uh, uh, as you mentioned, I, you, uh, I teach two weeks a year in Tilburg in the Netherlands. Um, and so last year, the class I taught, which is a you know, mandatory undergraduate economics class, more than half of the students were from overseas. And you uh, teach in what language? In English. And that's become, in effect, the lingua franca, if I can say that. Yes, of the, that's right. Of the, certainly of the higher education institutions, yeah. And uh, would that be true in a lot of other higher education institutions, that if one went to them, one would so, have a class in English, not in certain, German or... Yeah, that's true. I would imagine that France is more resistant to that than, than most other places. Germany, but, it's, yeah. Yeah, in, but it's certainly true but the smaller in, in Spain ones. or in Italy as well, right? So the, the, the institutions that try to attract their international students uh, or that are sort of the top of the line institutions who often have a lot of international faculty, they, they will offer, offer a lot of instruction in English. And that was certainly not the case 20 years ago. Yeah. Right? So that's, that's changed pretty rapidly, and presumably you'll see that in people's labor mobility numbers uh, down the road. Um, so that's an education. On the, uh, so just sort of on, the, on, the, on the work side of things, the commission has done similar things. So there's a bunch of occupations now where the licensing basically happens at the European level, right? So, uh, again, another libertarian hobby horse, right? Where they yes, where the horrible state uh, regulations, occupational licensing, you know. Right. That, so that, uh, and it's it's a number of important professions. So a bunch of the medical professions, architects, they can basically move across Europe uh, uh, freely now. And so that you know, so there's real progress is being is being made there uh, in that sense. And I think you know, the that'll help on the economic side a little bit as well with you know addressing some of the concerns about the the currency union. Though I don't think. Uh, that sh I don't think 
you know, forced migration should be the main right. channel through which uh, different parts of the continent uh, adjust. Um, but yeah, but that's, so that's, that's a big deal. I think it's also a, a big deal in light of some of the original goals of the union, right? I think if you're in a country that's drifting a little toward authoritarianism, it's extremely helpful that you can move somewhere else. That's, you know, that's. And other people can come in perhaps and. Yeah, the people who, yeah. Make but it if you, harder to. Yeah, if you really, if you'd like You can't that. close the borders. But, yeah, that's right. If you, if you. Which is what authoritarian <laughs> yeah, states yeah, often yeah. do, right? Well, no, that's right. right? So if you're a Hungarian yeah. and you want to leave Hungary, you, know, you can do that, right? That's very different from the way it was if you were in Hungary in 1956. Right. And you didn't like Hungary, you know? Right, <laughs> right. Way, yeah. I guess when Americans yeah. go, and maybe this is more my generation, younger Americans, but a much more up to date view of all this, mm -hmm. you do see all these people speaking different languages, obviously, as you, you know, go from one country to another, and you think, well, that's not really. I mean, one thing about America is everyone speaks English. And no, so. sure. So you would you would expect the mobility rates to be lower, right? Even if yes, the, even and keeping so, all the and it sort of makes you think. Well, this isn't really a yeah. unifying project because there's such a vast gap if one doesn't speak the same language. A, that may not be quite correct if everyone has English as a second there, language. It, yeah. And B, you know, there have been previous empires and multinational states where people spoke different languages, but are sort of understood each, I mean, so what, and they still I think, thought they were part of one, well, maybe they didn't, I don't know, it's a good question, I don't know what for the Austro-Hungarian I mean, Empire, big, did the, they think they were part of one entity, sort of? Uh, yeah, kind of. Sort of. Know. Yeah, maybe a little more something like Egypt with Adapharo, I don't know. But like I think Mozart uh, went to few, it's, what's funny when you read the history of Europe is, yeah. of course, it was so integrated, right? Yeah. Well, uh, they thought nothing about sort of going, migrate. living in uh, Vienna, uh, living yeah. in Salzburg, going to Prague, yeah. you know, having, of course, the trips to England, Haydn yeah. ends up in England, handles, becomes English. I mean, one forgets how much sort of there was of that, you know, in in, 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 pre, in the So it's never centuries. clear, it's never been clear to me I mean, how that's much very of, elite that's thing, what of course. That's exactly I mean, what I was going to say. So it's never been clear to me how much of that extended beyond sort of the, yeah. the elite. Yeah, presumably it did. And so that's a concern now, too, right? So you... The fact that it is more highly educated, younger folks, and a lot of the lingua franca is English, right? You, I don't think you want to end up in a situation where, right. the, where you know, there's barely any working class mobility, and in Barcelona and, and Berlin, everyone speaks English. Right? That's, I don't think that's the, right. that's the right outcome, and so it would be nice to... That is, in them. fact, the 18th century, incidentally. No, outcome. that's exactly what I'm saying. But, so you had, want, you, but it was problematic for obvious yeah, reasons, yeah. No, including right. like leading yeah. to revolutions and yeah, you know, yeah, nationalism yeah, and so yeah, forth. Right? Yeah. And so obviously it's a little broader now to begin with, just because right. of how society is organized, but I think it's important not to, to end up in an equilibrium where that's, basically, that's effectively what, what, what's happening. Um, uh, because it would be, I mean, it'd be nice if, if when Spain goes through one of its regular periods of 25% unemployment, it'd be nice if some of those unemployed people got the chance to go work in Germany. And that happens to some extent. And do they? I mean, why? Yeah, to some extent, but not, you know, not in the kind of mass numbers that uh, they used to occur, they used to occur in the U.S., right? So the way, uh, I think up to 1980 or 1990, what you would see in the U.S., you have a big negative shock to a state, unemployment rate goes up. And it's not, and wages did not don't, don't go down when that happens. Instead, people would move to a different state, and that's sort of the main adjustment mechanism. Now that has broken down a little bit in the U.S., uh, but, it, right. but but that it would be it, it would be nice if, if the EU had some of that. And beyond uh, year to year, there's this massive adjustment mechanism in the U.S. where you know millions, tens of millions, I suppose, of African yeah. Americans go from the south to the north. That's and right. yeah. I mean that yeah. permits yeah. a kind of yeah. both. Unifying of the country, but also job opportunities yes. for people who aren't going to, you know. That's right. Uh, yeah, no. Obviously, over the past few decades, we've seen that to some extent from the Midwest to the right. to the West and the South. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. But that's harder because of language, I suppose. And really, yeah. yeah. But it is. It's not hard otherwise. That is to say, I mean, if if I'm in no, you, Berlin you and I, you know, want to hire a Spanish. Yeah, he can come Labor. the next day, and he can vote in local elections. Yeah. Is that right? And yeah. he shows yeah. up, and there's yeah. no issue. With, there's no, no permit. There's no. You no, so you, stay, can, you can only stay three years. It'd be like no. hiring someone in in Massachusetts to come from Virginia. I mean, it's it's very similar to that, right? So that person at some point would also have to get a Massachusetts driver's license, and right. Things like that, right? So there are so, there are nominal procedures you have to follow, yeah, but but nothing beyond that. I think once the person, one difference is that it, only after I think a five year period does the person become a permanent resident of the of the new country uh, which gives you sort of you know full rights so you can no matter how much you abuse the welfare state you could ever be uh, uh -huh. sent back but that's really the only margin which it's different than in, in practice that doesn't that doesn't matter uh, for people and you mentioned so immigration both internal and then external that's obviously been a challenge and the migration crisis seemed like a big moment for the yeah. For Europe and for the EU, that's right. Talk of about course, that co a coincided with the Brexit vote too, to some extent. Yes. Um, I, 
I mean, I, the, obviously, since the, especially since the crisis, but a little bit before that, too, I don't think we can ascribe it purely to that. You've really seen the rise of anti-immigration politics in a bunch of European countries, um, certainly on the, there's more, uh, more on the northern side and the eastern side of the continent than in the, than in the south, ironically, even though that's, of course, where, right. where a lot of migrants first arrive. Um, and so, you know, I think it, it, to, to, to some extent it's driven more by the, the sort of ongoing, you know, adjustment processes in those societies driven by uh, uh, labor immigration from the 1960s and 70s uh, than right. necessarily about the, the sort of ongoing flows. I mean, a lot of those countries by now have changed their immigration rules that it, to, to an extent that it's almost become impossible for someone who is not uh, from another European Union country or a few select uh, rich other countries to, to, to immigrate at all. Um, and so, but I, I do think that the, the Syrian immigration flow, I think, intensified some of that sentiment. Um, obviously, you know, if, if you want to ascribe Brexit to it, it caused a lot of right. disruption. But I think in, the, in, in most European countries, it just, you know, it strengthened the far right parties a little bit. But, you know, I mean, in the end, not so much, right? I think if you, if you had told people eight years ago that, uh, when this happened, five years ago, that Angela Merkel would still be, yeah. Uh, chancellor, that the Dutch government would be the same one, uh, and Wilders it, it got wiped out during the European Parliament elections. I don't think people would have would have expected that, uh, and so I think it's 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 reasonably under under control. You do see sort of a hardening of of immigration rules, but yeah, that's there's a lot of internal immigration, right? And so I think that's 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 less um, less concerning. You see some symbolic measures targeting. Uh, Muslim residents that I'm not a, a, a big fan of, but uh, I think the leaders of the sort of center-right parties that, that adopt those measures are doing so in a very conscious way to sort of fend off the, right. the, the uglier versions of... And it's not as if, I guess, to get on the counterfactual, so, so making the pro-European argument here, but, yeah. um, you know, when France was France, before there was Schengen and before there was yeah. as much integration, France, because of its old relationships and uh, let in, as it probably should have, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands, maybe a million of uh, Algerians and others from fr former French colonies and so forth, they didn't, it's unfair to say they didn't do a very good job, but whatever, there wasn't great success in assimilation there, perhaps. And so what Americans look at that and think, oh my God, they have a huge problem in Europe of, of failure to assimilate, failure to, you know. but that's, again, would that be better if there were France and Germany and yeah, that you seems know, completely in different un countries. That seems, that or seems entirely unlikely, right? It because seems almost anything, like the EU yeah, would help on the would help, yeah, yeah on sure. the margins at least. Yeah. The assimilation process it gives people a little more leeway, and it, the, I, I, I fully agree. So the, the there is a separate immigration issue, uh, which is immigration from the eastern side of the European right. Union to the western. So side. that was sort of a Brexit and, thing. Uh, yes. So let's talk about Brexit and, and about that whole issue. Yeah, uh, and so that's much more directly tied to the European Union, right? And it's, and specifically specifically to the UK. So normally the way it works, you know, there's free movement within the Union. When uh, a bunch of Eastern European countries joined, uh, most, the, most European unions basically imposed a moratorium, and so there was some transition period during which free movement of people didn't fully apply to the new member states. Uh, the UK, under, I guess, then Prime Minister Cameron, decided we're not going to participate in that. And so they did not have the moratorium, and so there were dramatic fairly dramatic flows of, of uh, especially Polish workers to the UK, uh, because that was the only sort of rich country that they could immediately move and to. Why did the British do that? Uh, well, why, why did they, and then they called the Brexit referendum and they did a right. Scotland referendum. You know, why was right. David right. Cameron doing things? Uh, I don't right. know, some bizarre mix of trying to maximize his number of seats and his, uh, his, time, in, his time in office, I suppose. Um, that, I mean, it's a nicer way to say it. I mean, maybe it's ideal, idealism or they thought, yeah. you know, we're such a dynamic economy, we, well, can, maybe that's right. we can deal with that. I think it's, you know, the, yeah, a mix of opportunism and, 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 and idealism, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, is usually how, how politicians operate. And, yeah. um, but so I think that did contribute to the, to the, to the Brexit result a little bit. Um, I don't know. Obviously, it, it, when 52 percent of the country votes or something, the... It, 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 and you want to explain why? It's always a little silly to f focus on the five percent that's at the margin, right, totally, as opposed to the right. forty-five percent of, of people who are, you know, British Tories and they've never liked the EU that much, and they, you know, they've always been uh, sort of with two legs out, and so you run, a, you, you call a referendum, you know, who knows what happens? Uh, right. So I think, you know, I think it, it contributed, but sort of at at the margin, I don't think 
free movement of people in the European Union had been a long-standing concern of that many British voters. No. And we're speaking the day before, I guess, the British election here, it's December 11th, but uh, what in general do you think of Brexit? Is it a sort of hiccup in the broader scheme of things or a big moment, inflection point? It's a big, it's a certainly a big moment because it reduces the size of the European Union uh, pretty dramatically, right? It's obviously the, the UK is, is the most important military power in the Union, uh, pretty wealthy, also good, I think, at pushing the European Union toward more sort of free market measures, more economic liberalism. Really the big driver of the, the 80s, 90s push for a, for a full common market was, was Margaret right. Thatcher and the, and the UK government. Um, and so in, in that sense, it's, I think it's, it's big losses. On some, in some other ways, the UK was never fully a part of the European Union, of course, not part of the European Monetary Union, uh, not part of Schengen, the, the, the uh, abolition of, of passport controls. And so, you know, it was always a little, a little out. Uh, I think the the euro integrate the the monetary integration process left it more out than it was before in a way. Um, and so, I think it's a it's a very big deal, but you know, attenuated in in, in that sense. Uh, I think for the UK itself, it's a it's a big mistake. Um, I, I mean, I think part of it is that you know, they, I think there's an, certainly a, an aspect to. British public discourse that still sees themselves as a as an empire uh, yeah. in a way that they obviously aren't. Um, I think it jeopardizes the situation in Northern Ireland, which I think has worked nicely because both the UK and Ireland were part of the European Union, and so it was much easier to to have this sort of in between space that Northern Ireland currently is, right? Where it, because so much had already been unified around it that you right. uh, the, that it became a lot easier to. To come up with a with a durable solution, um, I think for I mean obviously it restricts the the freedoms of uh, people in the UK who want to move to European countries, people in European countries who want to move to the UK to, to some extent, um, and I don't think that the sort of libertarian buccaneer Britain version of Brexit is going to come to fruition. Is that right? right? Yeah. So you would hear these stories about how they would be they'd be Singapore. Right. on the North Sea or whatever they called it. Uh, certainly from uh, where we're sitting now, uh, which with the party manifestos and where the Tories are going, where Labour is going, that doesn't seem likely, right? So the, we're for sure going to see less immigration. We're going to see the reintroduction of state aid if the Tories get their way and the nationalization of a bunch of industries if Labour uh, gets its way. Um, they, the, a big complaint that you hear from British politicians when they're campaigning against the European Union or really in general is about European regulations. The, the example right. they give is, you know, bananas have to have a certain shape. So uh, those regulations are typically what we call trade harmonization rules, right? Because you need to have common definitions if you're going to be in a common market, right? It's like the U.S. has an FDA, right? You have to you have to define what's legal, what's not. You have to come up with product categories. Uh, um, and th those have to be coordinated at the European level if you're going to have a, a free movement of goods. Um, I don't think they're going to repeal any of those rules. Right? They're just on the books, and they kind of sit there, and now they're British law instead of EU law. Uh, and that, that's not going to change until they maybe reach a trade agreement with the U.S. or whatever. But then it's also – that's not like – the, the dream of sovereignty that they that, no. they, that they had. So they'll have to reach a trade agreement with Britain, with Europe, yeah. and a trade agreement with the U.S. That's right. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, you're going to be in this mess for for a number of years. So I think the upside is super limited, um, especially because you know a lot of this stuff that people who like the free market system we care about, you know, they have a low, low low taxes, things like that. They could still read right, those are not European level competencies. They, those Britain was able to do. Uh, itself, and in fact, you know, Britain has a flourishing financial capital of the world. Right. It's not like it's been impossible to do anything. Uh, and it's Quite the contrary, I think they risk yeah. losing law firms and accounting firms. That's and, right. Yeah, and even finance firms yeah. if they're and not then, yeah, plugged right. into. If you can't hop on a plane and go to Stuttgart or go to you yeah. know Milan and cut yep. deals and have yeah. no. And the upside is just so narrow because it's stuff like oh, we get to reclaim our 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 fishing waters. You know, the, I don't know. Like it's, yeah, it's no, I, I was struck by this. I mean, I. I sort of was vague and sympathetic to Brexit on a kind of nostalgia for the British Empire yeah, kind yeah. of grounds. But actually, it's really more Little England than British Empire thinking, I would say. It's not yeah. Churchillian. It's more the kind of, you know, let's protect ourselves and uh, from immigration and from competition in some respects. Uh, and I, I also think, don't you think it damages the 
liberal liberalism in the good sense of the you know, uh, in in Europe. I mean, Britain was a force for generally more mar- more market oriented policies right, right. and for liberal democracy in Europe. Yeah. And it's not good to have them out of the decision making. No. I should think. I mean, if you care about you yeah. know putting pressure on Orban not to do stuff. Be better to have Britain in there. All yeah, in all. maybe, maybe not. Well, yeah, I guess they were not reliable yeah, on this. Yeah, maybe they yeah. didn't. They weren't very good in the Balkans. It turned out for all their yeah. great liberal tradition, they were actually yeah. kind of not great. And the authorities trend. in the European Parliament, when yeah. when the European Parliament voted on the to start an Article Seven procedure, which is what you the way in which the EU deals with violations of fundamental values in its member states, uh, that that most British Conservative M- MEPs. Uh, actually voted against starting that procedure, right? Even though it, it passed overwhelmingly. On sort of national sovereignty grounds, or? Who knows what they're doing over there. They, I mean, there was a kind of weird group now because they, right, they, they have. Uh, they're going to leave, and they, but, but I would assume on national sovereignty grounds. But then that's a very cynical view of national sovereignty, right? Because that says, you know, within your borders, you can do whatever you want, right? That's not, uh, I think, how, uh, right. you know, how people who, but there was some proof of liberal written, democracy. No, it's I mean, uh, deal with those issues, right? It's not that's that was certainly not the view that British conservatives had during the Cold War of the Soviet Union. Right. Uh, you know, oh, we're not allowed to violate your sovereignty. Right. That was pretty strong in the '30s. Let's not forget. And yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, there was a, yeah. There it is. It is interesting how. Um, anyway, yeah. That's, that's, um, so let's talk politics. I mean, just on the sort of populism, nationalism, authoritarianism side, where in Europe as a whole. Are you, you know, reasonably confident in the next 5, 10, 20 years? Or how worried are you? How strong is that? You follow. I mean, here I feel like I have a sense. I don't know yeah. that I'm right about how intellectually, culturally, how strong it is or how not so strong it is. But obviously I don't read that much of the European yeah. media I mean, press and culture. And I mean, it's certainly, I mean, it's a lot stronger than it was in the, in the 90s. It's, I think, the, the big shift. Um, so far, so good, I would say, is the, I think. Is that Gosh's right, despite judgment. all the... Yeah, so you've seen, really, what, you, what you've seen is sort of a fragmentation of the political spectrum, right? So, roughly speaking, obviously, it's, yeah, it's 28 countries, so this, this is not, uh, I'll be generalizing a little bit, but you have, you had a big social democratic family of parties, big Christian democratic family of parties, a somewhat smaller sort of classical liberal family. Those three have sort of lost a good chunk of their appeal, but together they're still really uh, dominant in the European Parliament and in a lot of national uh, legislatures. But what you have seen is the, on the, the, rise, the rise, especially on the right, of these more nationalist populist parties. And in some countries, those parties have really become a dominant force. And so that's, a, so that's true in Hungary, that's true in Italy. Uh, so that's, that's uh, I think, a little concerning, but uh, of course does reflect, I think, really, the, sort of what a lot of voters are concerned about. And so, you know, to the, I think, some pressure from those, from that, from that angle, and also on the left, from more far left parties that haven't been as successful, but in some countries have been reasonably successful. Uh, Syriza in Greece was uh, in government right. for a while. Podemos in Spain, which is uh, weirdly Venezuela affiliated, uh, uh, had its had its moment. Um, you know, at, you, you, to some extent, that also just plays an expressive role, I think, uh, for voters. Um, and maybe shifts sort of, uh, sort of it's, uh, at least agenda priorities for the more mainstream parties. Uh, I mean, I think if if the if those numbers remain steady from here on out, or maybe start going down a little bit as the uh, economic recovery nears completion, I think then we it was a you know it, it was it was a bit scary in some places for a while, but uh, fine, you know. <laughs> um, but obviously, we don't know if that's going to happen. I, I, I don't see much strengthening anymore of those of those movements, but um, you know, not, I mean, it may well be that Salvini will soon be uh, in charge in Italy, and then he ha- then you suddenly have you know Poland, Hungary, Italy, uh, maybe Romania, you know, maybe next time in France it doesn't uh, it goes the other way, and right. the pen go- and you know, so it can still it can still go in what I think would be a very ugly direction, but I uh, but I'm less worried than I think people rightly were five years ago. And again, I guess yeah. there's the kind of uh, and you, compared you know, to you what five question. years by five years. Like, I don't know. We're not going to come up here with a 25 year long plan of who's going to win what election. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah. You know, like these things are fragile and compl- and difficult. You know, it's not. Well, but again, it's not as if 
if you compare it compared to what? I mean, it's not like there wasn't a very strong French Communist Party, Italian Communist Party back before right. much of the integration yeah. of Europe. Yeah, it's not NATO like, had to it's get not like Greece didn't have a coup, <laughs> an actual well, Fran- yeah, junta a Spain and, in Spain the late had, 60s and early 70s. Spain, of course, Spain, Spain and Portugal had a dictator had until 75? From that, before, yeah. I mean. Yeah, well, yeah. sure, but, but know, no, still no, sitting there. Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. it's not as if, like, yeah. it was really great, you know, yeah. liberal well, and obviously was thriving. All of the Eastern member states were captured, yeah, so whatever. So, yeah, no, I mean... People are a little unrealistic when they sort of. No, know. that's exactly right. So I think, yeah, that's precisely right. And I think, you know, the uh, you know, the, pr- the prudent position, I think, is to say, well, you know, this could be a lot worse. But in terms of political culture, you don't feel like the entire European left is going in a Corbyn direction or a kind of, uh, and the European right's all going in a Le Pen direction. So, and one sort of vaguely feels that. And of course, sitting in America, one probably vaguely feels yeah. that because we're worried about it here, you know? Yeah, and I and think... And so it becomes like a model, you know? And I do I mean, think that a lot of the perception in the U.S. is driven by both developments in the U.K. and the British press and how it portrays the rest of Europe, which is often through a British lens. Uh, because if you, say, you look at, uh, at Germany, the large party on the left in Germany now is the Green Party, which is, you know, very environmentalist, but kind of modern and free markety. Right. you know? Very different from what, uh, from what Corbyn is doing. Um, the old Communist Party there has not filled the void left by the Social Democrats. Um, in Spain, a traditional Social Democratic left party has now, uh, you know, taken the reins and Podemos has, has lost some of its influence. Uh, I, I certainly don't think you can say that, that as a generalized uh, statement of what's been happening in European politics. Right in France, the big development over the last uh, five years has been the rise of a sort of centrist good governance, you know, kind of neoliberal party right. led by Emmanuel Macron who maybe have, has not delivered on, you know, what the, the highest hopes people had of him. But, uh, you know, it's certainly not an indication that everything is drifting toward the two extremes. Um, in Germany, the Christian Democrats are now very comfortably uh, it's, uh, uh, positioned at the, at the heart of the political spectrum and have completely annihilated the Social Democrats. Um, the Netherlands has a broad coalition around the center in Belgium, you have a you know center right coalition that is that has ex- that excludes the the more neo fascist Flemish nationalists, but has contains at its heart a large fam- Flemish nationalist party. Um, in Italy, you now have you know it's, I mean none of it is as terrible as as you would think from those from those depictions. In Finland, the Social Democrats did reasonably well last time around, and the 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 so the far left parties just haven't done that well, in part because m- more economically moderate uh, Green parties, I think, uh, okay. have, have captured some of the energy there. Uh, Reds, it's gone toward environmentalism instead of communism, which is, I think, a trade that I'd be happy to, better, to, yeah, to yeah. take. And the, the Netherlands has a party for the animals now that has a few seats. They stand for the rights of animals because they, the animals themselves cannot vote. And they support things for like... Now, for yeah, now. Yeah, for now, for now. They support right. things like free choice of sexual partner for, for farm animals and things like that. So, you know, you get more into the kind of esoteric uh, uh, lefty thinking. Um, so I'm not super worried about that. On the right, you know, I think some center-right parties have done better at sort of steering off the threat from the far right than others. Um, I, I, I think the U.S. and the U.K., actually, the, the center-right parties have let themselves be captured oh. by kind of very explicit entryism here uh, and by... The, the Brexiteers in the UK, I think the, sort of the traditional Christian Democratic parties or in some other countries, the more classical liberal parties have done a reasonably good job of sort of capturing some of the themes of the far right uh, without going all the way down uh, what they uh, strive for. I remember when my friend uh, Bob Kagan, who you know, wrote that book, I think it was called Paradise and Power, short book 15 years ago, I guess. Europeans, it was viewed widely as kind of an attack on Europe and a sort of denigration of Europe. They're not interested in power. They just have a happy mm-hmm. life there. It's a slightly, uh, you know, it's a museum or it's a you know, Disneyland kind of thing, you know, and very nice. And we're, you know, tough and we maintain the world order. And I think there's some truth to that, incidentally. And as an American, I'm sort of proud that we have this role. But I, 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 Bob himself always used to insist the book really wasn't supposed to be critical of Europe. I mean, it was a yeah, description. Yeah, people make, you know? It's not, and, yeah, 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 and that in a way, we do we want the opposite? Do we want Europe deciding, yeah. hey, that's what we want to be? Now, there's something weird. I would just say this is generational, maybe. You know, if you grew up when I grew up and you study history a little bit and stuff, you just, there's something hard to adjust to about Europe being 
basically inward looking might not be quite fair, but, but not thinking that it's going to shape the history of the entire world over the next 50 years. That it will be a participant, that it will do some good, you know, but that basically we're going to have a world struggle between whoever, the U.S. and yeah. China and maybe some other, you know, uh, rogue regimes yeah. and maybe and the, the Middle trying East to build bridges or, or, in between. And, the, you know, they'll be doing whatever useful yeah, stuff they're yeah. doing. But maybe that's just silly not to accept that that's, that's the decision in a sense that Europe itself has made and maybe given the wars of the first half of the 20th century, not a crazy decision. I think the British conservative talking point, which was never had a certain uh, resonance, was why are we aren't embarrassed by our history, <laughs> so why do we have to move beyond yeah. history? You know, I understand if you were a German or whatever, they would say, uh, you know, fine, you want to sort of be European, not German, and maybe that's good, but we British, we're on the right side of those wars, you know, most, and, and pretty much, and not pretty much, but very much so, and then the Cold War, and so mm -hmm. we should be able to keep that going, but I suppose maybe that's just nostalgia and a combination of nostalgia and lack of realism and I mean, to think that somehow it's a terrible thing that Europe isn't more outward looking, doesn't spend more on defense, I mean, all that sort of stuff. Or is it a problem down the road, a sort of lack of vision, kind of a, I don't know. Well, it's, I, I do think that a lack of realism is a big factor, right? No individual European country at this point has, just has the size, either economically or militarily, and I guess the militarily kind of follows from the economically, to really be a superpower. Uh, and the European, U European Union as a whole just isn't, you know, a political actor in that right. geopolitical way where you have, you know, a shared military and whatever, a shared political discourse where you can determine whether you go to war. Uh, and, and so I think realistically there's just no, no, no unified actor there that can play a dominant role on the geopolitical stage. Uh, it, I, I do think that it's, it would probably be helpful if the, the EU remained a little more involved on the, on the military and national security side of things through NATO, you know, like the, the, the spending numbers could be a little high, you know. Yeah. But that, but that's more, I think, as part of an Atlantic alliance that's on the on the national security side, really led by the U.S. And I don't think actually there are. I don't think actually that there are a ton of American uh, conservatives who really like it when uh, the EU starts setting its own right. uh, geopolitical priorities, right? I think we. Uh, I, I think. I, I don't think. I mean, so there, there's there's always a weird dimension of bad faith to these complaints, right? Because it's not like, oh, when the goal was trying to uh, set his own path, that's really, those are the, those are the days we miss. I don't think right. uh, that's true for, for most of those people. Or, I mean, what would it look like if Germany decided to take on a, a, a super dominant role? It would be much more about balancing China and the U.S., I think, uh, than it is now where Germany remains in this kind of subservient uh, um, role in NATO. So, so I think that... It, it, in that sense, I don't think it's 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 concerning. I think, in, you know, they're in just as a matter of resources, it'd be nice if the sort of Western yeah. alliance were a little, uh, um, you know, stronger. Know, stronger. But, yeah, I mean, yeah. Kagan makes this point. I mean, the U.S. plus Europe, even yeah. a Europe that's a little bit recalcitrant and a little yeah. bit difficult to work with sometimes, and all, is a heck of a lot stronger than the U.S. by itself. Oh yeah, yeah. And the U.S. either Europe just checking out on the one hand and collapsing, which doesn't seem likely, but or Europe setting itself up as an alternative, neither of those is really in the U.S. interest probably. I mean, in a way, a somewhat subservient but big enough to help role isn't a that, crazy yeah. outcome from the point of view of American national yeah. interest, presumably. No, that's, or even from the European perspective, I think. You know, right. like, I, I mean, I don't know. I think that's, it's really the sweep. But it's, it, I mean, it's frustrating for, the, for, for people on the U.S. side because they, you know, we're, 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 you know, we're deploying all these resources and Europe isn't doing its part. Of course, from the European uh, standpoint, it's, you know, the U.S. goes out there to, uh, to Afghanistan and Iraq yeah, and right. destroys our Iran deal. And, you know, we, we, don't, we don't really have a say. Uh, I think that's just as frustrating. I think, you know, it, it's an alliance. Both sides will have to, uh, to some extent, uh, uh, accept the downsides of it. But do you agree that, I mean, younger Europeans, you know, they just, that, they do assume that Europe will not play a role anything like the U.S. or China. I mean, they, will, they won't be an autonomous, you know, military force that would sort of yeah, that's, do things. That's no, just, that's, I, that's I, gone. I, yeah, I don't, yeah, that's not, I mean, I, I don't think I, honestly, I don't think I've ever heard anyone who is not actively involved in European policymaking even discuss the idea. Yeah. And so the notion that if we, I mean, pull out or if we look unreliable, that Germany, France at all decide that, 
they have to sort of take care of themselves. I mean, what, what do you think happens in that I mean, case? but that would be such a dramatic shift, right? That, yeah. that, 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 that could really, I think, trigger a, a different response. But that's so far removed from, I think, where we are now, even under the Trump administration, that it, it wouldn't happen, right? That, I mean, the, there's, been, there's been a lot of talk about this, but I think in the end there are more U.S. troops now in Europe than there were yeah. uh, three years ago. And generally, well, you know, there's been talking about this for a long time, and it, mostly it's been the dog that didn't bark, right? And at the end of the day... Yeah. Europe looks yeah. kind of like it did 20 years ago in yeah. terms of alliance structures. Yeah, and, and so I don't forth. think that, uh, on the military side, I don't think that relationship is that much healthier, that, that much less healthy now than it was in 2004 when we had the whole no. Europe, New Europe stuff. And it was not, you know, massive demonstrations in Europe, uh, basically right. against the U.S. government. Right. Uh, same thing happened in the early 80s. You know, right. that is, right. so, you know, it's not like it was all beautiful during the Cold War and now it all ended. Uh, so what worries you the most in this generally slightly upbeat uh, account well, of Europe? Well, so I, so I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm worried that now that the UK leaves, the, the EU is going to drift in a more statist, uh, big government direction. Uh, you know, in part because the, the, the sort of the European Council and those institutions do sort of set the tone for law policy making. So there's there are these centralized tendencies. Uh, I worry about that a little. Worry a little bit that Europe has very low population growth, uh, and I don't think. Um, we've come up with good uh, ways to, to deal with that, and that just comes with a lot of downside. Right? It makes it harder for, to, to, for people to have a, a, a good life in retirement if they don't have as many children around. It makes the burden of debt uh, greater. Of right. course, it limits your, your economic and military power. Um, so I'd say that's the second concern. And then thirdly, I'm worried that there's going to be a situation where you have two countries who are EU member states who drift uh, e even further in an, uh, uh, in an authoritarian direction than Poland already has. And between the two of them, they'll be able to basically block all measures uh, taken against them. And uh, that will slowly lead to sort of the unraveling of the, the EU legal order. Those would be my three concerns. And the third would lead would generally be unfriendly to liberal democracy, in your view, and friendly well, to yeah, plus authoritarianism. Well, yeah, plus once, once you have two members that back each other up, they can violate, you know, all, when it really comes down to it, they can violate whatever uh, European decision-making, right? And so that, that, I think, really goes to the heart of the, the, the binding legal character of the And it presumably encourages union. others in that's other right. countries to sort of go that's down that. That, then it, Yeah, that's precisely. And I suppose that there, Europe's kind of weakness vis-a-vis -vis Russia, China, so the focus on commerce, the unwillingness to sort of step up and, you know, is a problem in the sense that it, it leaves it open to this kind of, once there's developments like this in a couple of countries, then there's a failure to take on those, you know, yeah. it, it, the system is not really set yeah. up to yeah. resolve these things, you might say. Well, yeah. no, it would require really dramatic changes by the rest of the union, right? They would have to say, okay, look, we're going to get rid of all of our unanimity rules for the most essential items. We're just going to say, okay, the two of you are out or whatever. You, right. You, Hungary, you don't get your subsidies anymore, which would lead to the collapse of the Hungarian economy immediately. Um, uh, but now, so one, a, a second well, So what about that? That's kind of an interesting question, right? Yeah. I mean, so Hungary, which they're also unhappy about, yeah. I think, yeah. with, good just, with good reason, still gets large subsidies. Yeah, they're the biggest beneficiary. Uh, because, well, you know, because it's you know, poor and uh, there's a right. lot. Of, so the, the EU budget, basically, it's about 1% of GDP of the union. 30% uh, of it is agriculture uh, subsidies. Uh, of course, the core task of any government. Uh, and about 30% is sort of cohesion funds, as we call it, which is subsidies for, for poor areas. Um, and the money comes from? Contributions from the member states. But by? By basically based on how, how, how well how proportional to your GDP, basically. Some countries get discounts. The UK has always had a large discount. Uh, the Netherlands has one, too. I think maybe Finland and Germany, too. But it's a um, transfer, basically. It's a transfer, basically. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, yeah, and it's certainly for Hungary, it's a it's a lot of net income. Well, in the, the way you see their behavior reflected now in the negotiations over the next seven-year budget for the for the European Union is that a lot of northern states say, "Look, we're <laughs> we're not going to subsidize these countries that are they're behaving so poorly." Uh, um, especially, well, it's obviously easy for a lot of the northern countries to 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 already. Um, appeal to to their voters in kind of a populist manner by saying we're making these contributions to other countries. Why don't they take take care of themselves? And then if countries are explicitly misbehaving and going out of their way to insult European institutions, I don't think it's crazy to say, okay, well, we'll make the budget a little less generous this time. Um, but that's very different from a more drastic measure of specifically targeting uh, Hungary uh, or Poland or or maybe Romania at some point. Uh, 
uh, as punishment for, for deeds done, right? This is more of a, you know, build right. up goodwill and it's reflected in the budget. But I suppose the authoritarian populist strain, if it gets stronger, it does obviously yeah. stress the union and... Uh, for sure, yeah. So that's a... That's uh, a that's right. And that's uh, it would it'd be bad in both ways, I suppose, yeah. 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 Okay, anything we should be looking for as we go ahead over the next year, two, three? I mean, what do you... Was it sort of any dramatic inflection points? That you, well, I guess how Brexit plays out would be important. That's really the biggest issue, right? So... Uh, as you said, we're talking the day before the election, but no matter who wins, that's, it's not going to be over anytime soon. Even if Boris Johnson gets his majority and they formally leave at the end of January, that would only start a transition period during which the UK will be subject to all of EU law without being able to influence it politically, so that'll go well. Um, and then uh, during that period, they need to negotiate the uh, sort of next relationship uh, and then once that's settled, there will have to be negotiations about uh, the sort of permanent trade agreement. Uh, you don't think it'll, it, go, it'll go for a while, and that's and a big deal. So that's going to. I don't think it gives life. ideas to nationalists and other big countries that hey, well, if they got out, why don't yeah. we get so out? So we've certainly it? seen. Sort of, well, I think it's, it's it's been the other way around actually. People have seen it's been such a mess. Yeah. Well, that's that's the, that, yeah, yeah. yeah. The numbers have gone up a little bit for the for the EU. Is that uh, right? In uh -huh. European countries. Yeah. And so the it, it doesn't seem right now, at least. That in it, fact, it may well. I think it may well have cost, uh, for example, Le Pen the election that she had been associated with uh, leaving the EU, and that had become so uh, so unacceptable, and she had to go back on that. But people didn't really trust it. I think that 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 probably helped uh, Macron at least a little bit. And culturally, just final question. I mean, for younger people, mm -hmm. uh, I am struck when I meet them. They, of course, they're from different nations and they speak languages and they're proud of. They know their own nation's history better than others. But mm -hmm. they are much more European than I think than maybe your generation, certainly than mine. I mean, I, do, you, do you believe that? And that continues. You think? I mean, just in terms of certainly among educated people, at least. The, yeah, I think the so, European for sure. identity. There are. I mean, as you're saying, especially so of the people who are. In college now, and it sort of started, I think, around my generation. Such a large share of people spend at least some time living in a different EU country or working in a different EU so country. So, even with a nationalist populist backlash, you're not going to have a huge numbers of Germans wanting to relitigate their grievances against France or, or, uh, uh, or uh, Hungarians uh, against. On behalf of those Hungarians who were stuck in other countries because of the way the borders were well, I mean, drawn, you, I mean, you don't see much of that. I, I, mean, I doubt it, but you know, the you have to <laughs> you have to maintain institutions that allow for some uh, some some oversight and filtering of of uh, the the rawest emotions. I think. That's the, yeah, one underestimates in a way what an achievement yeah. it is not to have these bad things yeah, happen no, that's for right. that's right. decades. That's right. And there's a kind of complacency, perhaps, about. Yeah, exactly. And I think that that is what underlies a lot of the criticism, right? That you know, obviously, it's not a perfect. The EU is not a perfect institution. Europe is not a perfect continent. But uh, I think what you, your your focus on the counterfactual has been has been very. Uh, it's going to damage helpful. me among my Eurosceptic yeah. friends. I won't uh -huh. be invited to dinner with Boris Johnson there, but uh -huh. ten Downing Street. But that's that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. Stan Voiger, thanks very much for uh, you, joining me today, and thank you for joining us on Conversations.